Hi, everyone. Good, good afternoon. Welcome to this, uh, this virtual event, which is a briefing on the benefits of headwater forest management. I'm Henry McCann. I'm a research associate with the Public Policy Institute of California. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, kick off the program today. So the first thing that I wanna do is extend a warm thanks to the funders of this research and, uh, and for this event. They are the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation and the US Department of Agriculture. Thank you. I also wanna point out that um, PPIC recently published a report on Monday called the Benefits of Headwater Forest Management. And that's what this event is, is um, based off of and is, is built around. And the report and the technical appendix, which contain all of the, um, the references and bibliography, along with, with these slides that I'm about to present are all available at ppic.org. So you can um, access them all there. Let's see, the program today is gonna consist of a short presentation on, uh, on an, an overview of the findings of our research. And then we're gonna switch to a, a panel discussion. We have a great group of panelists today and um, that's gonna be moderated by Van Butzik, a, a co-author on this report. And then we're gonna end with uh, about 10 minutes of audience Q&A. So uh, apropos of that, um, we, are, we, are, uh, we are collecting questions right now. Um, and at, at any point throughout the entire program um, at the following website, uh, excuse me, following email address, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. So if a question um, comes up during the presentation or the, or the discussion, please pop it into an email and send it to this address. And we'll circle back with as many questions as possible uh, in the last uh, portion of the program. I also wanna point out that the, um, the bios, the long bios for our panelists today are available at the PPIC events webpage. Also, if you pre-registered for this event, then later today you'll receive an email with a link to a very short survey uh, asking for feedback on how we did today. So um, we really appreciate you taking just a few minutes to fill that out and uh, tell us how we did. And, uh, and we thank you in advance for doing that. So without further ado, um, let's jump into the benefits of headwater forest management. So the first thing that I wanna do is, um, is to acknowledge the rest of the, the researchers on this research project. Uh, we had a great group of folks from different uh, expertise um, and um, the interdisciplinary team was, um, was a really a, a pleasure to work with. And I also want to acknowledge um, contributions from Claudia Herbert and Samantha Smith uh, in terms of research support for the project. So what I'm gonna do is start out by providing some context on managing for a mosaic structure in headwater forests. Then I'm gonna describe the meat of our research, which was on the benefits and beneficiaries of forest management. And then I'm gonna discuss the implications of those findings for policy and management. So prior to European settlement, uh, the mixed conifer forests of the Sierra Nevada and Southern Cascade were fine grained mosaics of different tree densities, species, sizes, and ages. The open and complex structure of these forests reduced the risk of large, wild, large severe wildfires and enhanced their ability to survive droughts and pests. The exclusion of indigenous burning practices, early timber harvest methods, and aggressive wildfire suppression have all contributed to making these forests denser over time. So forests today have fewer small, have, excuse me, have many more small trees fewer larger trees and are vastly simplified in structure compared to the uh, resilient mosaic forests in, in the pre-European time. And we're living with the consequences of these structural changes today in terms of the large catastrophic and severe wildfires that we experience in the, in the headwater region, as well as the widespread tree die-off triggered by drought and beetle attack. So the overall framework for managing forests today is to create and maintain some of the structural characteristics of pre-European mosaic forests that made these forests resilient in their environment. And what this entails is using techniques such as mechanical thinning, prescribed burning, and managed wildfire to create more variation 
in terms of tree densities and openings and tree sizes. And we broadly refer to this approach as improving forest health. Forest management experts suggest that this, this uh, approach must be greatly expanded in terms of pace and scale in order to be effective and that healthy forest conditions need to be maintained over time with regular treatments in order to retain their resilient characteristics. Recent large severe wildfires and the widespread tree die off during the 2012-2016 drought really increased focus on reducing wildfire risk and improving forest health. And this has set off a surge of collaborative forest management efforts at the local, state, and federal level. Expanding on the pace and scale of these efforts and long-term stewardship are gonna be heavy lifts for private and public entities. Developing a clear sense of the benefits and beneficiaries of improving forest health while acknowledging the uncertainties and trade-offs is key to motivate long-term stewardship and identify the partners to support it. I wanna acknowledge though that, um, that these benefits and beneficiaries are, are well understood by many in, in the headwater region and in the forest management community broadly. And in some cases have been part of those discussions for decades. The other thing that I wanna do is set expectations clearly. Um, this report uh, does not attempt to estimate the, the, how much these benefits are worth, nor how much um, folks should be paying for them. We felt that that would be premature at this time, though it is something that we're working towards. What this report really set out to do is to consolidate scientific understanding about these benefits and to clarify some of the linkages between headwater forests and the groups in society that benefit from increasing the resilience of these forests over time. We felt that this hadn't been done in a concise and digestible way yet and that it would be very valuable groundwork to advance the policy discussion. What our research found is that forest management that improves forest health can also support the well being of rural communities, reduce smoke impacts on public health, store carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from wildfires, protect water quality from post fire erosion, and increase water supply. And it's important to point out that uh, the benefits listed here are just a few out of the whole universe of benefits of healthy headwater forests. As, as researchers, we deliberately selected these benefits to look at because they could um, potentially be more easily quantified and monetized as a way to motivate long-term stewardship at scale. Expanding forest health treatments can stimulate the forest management and wood utilization sectors, which can lead to opportunities for local economic growth. Healthy headwater forests can also help avoid disruptions from smoke and wildfire on tourism and recreation, which are activities that many of the communities uh, in that region rely on. Also, when applied strategically at landscape scale, forest thinning can contribute to reducing the threat of wildfire to, to communities. The beneficiaries of these outcomes include, of course, the residents of, of, of headwater communities, but also the forest management sector and tourists recreational visitors, and the businesses that, that serve them. Importantly, many of the communities in the headwater region currently lack the infrastructure and workforce needed to expand uh, forest health treatments. So targeted investments in these areas will be needed for sustaining higher levels of forest management and for realizing these economic benefits over the long term. Also, thinning is just one part of the portfolio of community wildfire resilience uh, tactics. Communities still have to engage and, and invest in um, modifying the, uh, the materials that they use to reduce susceptibility to wildfire damage, reduce hazardous uh, vegetation around structures, and to plan in advance for wildfire emergencies. Research suggests that proactive forest management is the key to avoiding acute wildfire smoke impacts in the future. It also tells us that low and moderate severity wildfires pose a lower risk to public health compared to the large uncontrolled wildfires that we experience today. Prescribed fire and managed wildfire are techniques for more controlled release of smoke compared to these fires that we're experiencing today. 
avoiding um, or reducing smoke impacts on public health benefits the urban and rural communities in the Headwater region, especially uh, those sensitive populations such as children, the elderly, and people with heart and lung disease. But it also, it also benefits communities outside of the Headwater region in the Central Valley, uh, Eastern California, and Western Nevada. Also, the healthcare systems that these communities rely on stand to benefit in terms of avoiding costly spikes in emergency care associated with these large wildfire events. Reducing, uh, uh, so uh, fuels have been building up in these forests um, over decades. And the initial treatment, uh, the initial use of strategic use of fire will generate a lot of smoke. And over the long term, strategic use of fire is really essential for maintaining healthy forest conditions. One of the consequences of this could be that frequent but less concentrated smoke becomes more common in the headwater region in the future. Compared to prescribed burning and managed wildfire, mechanical thinning alone has no smoke impacts. However, these techniques are often used in combination. The proliferation of small trees in, in the headwater region has increased the amount of, of carbon stored in these forests, but it's also increased their vulnerability to wildfire, droughts, and pests. So research suggests that forest management that channels growth into large fire resistant trees increases the durability of forest carbon while limiting greenhouse gas emissions from wildfires. Storing, storing carbon in healthy forests is, uh, is, is essential for California in terms of helping to achieve greenhouse gas reduction objectives. Um, also, um, uh, participants in carbon uh, uh, carbon sequestration markets and credit programs also stand to benefit um, from storing carbon in healthy forests, as well as society at large in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to global climate change. It's critically important that California continue to measure changes in forest carbon over time, but more is needed on improving the accuracy of these, of these carbon accounting approaches to inform our forest management strategies. Also, the choice of management technique uh, influences the overall carbon balance. For example, mechanical thinning offers additional opportunities for carbon storage in terms of long-lasting wood products that strategic use of fire does not. I want to point out that in California, we use um, state cap and trade revenues to support uh, dozens of large forest health projects around the state with the explicit goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is through CAL FIRE's Forest Health Grant Program. One of the larger uh, recipients of, of those funds has been the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, which is really a consortium of projects that have reducing greenhouse gas emissions as, as an objective. And I think we'll hear more about that project from Angie Avery during the panel discussion. Heavy rains following severe wildfires can rapidly wash sediment and debris into streams. And this can impair the infrastructure that we use to manage water for multiple purposes, including recreation and hydropower and water supply. And it can also harm um, aquatic ecosystems as well. Avoiding post-fire erosion is therefore uh, beneficial for um, the operators of multi-purpose reservoirs in the, in the region, as well as the off-channel hydroelectric power producers the aquatic ecosystems, and the water-based recreation sector. Importantly, the large foothill reservoirs, which are really the backbone of the state's surface water delivery system, are somewhat buffered from post-fire erosion by smaller upstream reservoirs that can capture and, and trap some of the sediment and debris after a wildfire. <clears throat> so this catchment effect has to be part of, of, uh, of assessing post-fire risk uh, in, uh, in watersheds. That being said, every tributary is slightly different and has different levels of risk and vulnerable assets. And I'll, I'll say that this is an area where water suppliers and hydropower producers in the region are really closely paying attention to the potential avoided costs of proactive forest health efforts. And we may hear about uh, one of those efforts from Willie Whittlesey, who's with us today from the Yuba Water Agency. Um, uh, he's gonna be uh, joining us on the panel. Preliminary research also suggests that forest thinning can reduce the amount of water demanded by trees, increasing the amount of stream flow in the range of 
six to 14 percent in some wetter tributaries. And in a somewhat um, in a somewhat counterintuitive and somewhat surprising finding, preliminary research also suggests that uh, open lower density forests in the Sierra Nevada may do a better job of accumulating snowpack and delaying the melting of snowpack compared to dense closed canopy forests. The beneficiaries of course of increasing water supply include um, water suppliers and, their consu and water consumers, uh, the producers of hydropower, electricity, uh, of hydropower uh, and their customers, aquatic ecosystems, and, uh, and water-based recreation uh, sector, including those who visit the region for those reasons and the businesses that serve those visitors. It's important to point out here that as vegetation grows back over time, which it does, um, without regular treatment, the benefits to, uh, to snowpack and to stream flows will actually decrease over time. So this is an important point to make in terms of the value of maintaining healthy forest conditions over time with respect to this particular benefit. However, there remains uncertainty about how much, when, and where um, these benefits will occur in the headwater region. And this is in part because of the relatively small footprint and short time frame of, of the research that helps us understand these benefits. So at this point, findings can't be generalized to uh, larger watersheds or across, uh, across larger timeframes, though, though that research is headed that direction. The mosaic forest structure is a model for implementing forest, uh, for, for designing and implementing forest management projects with the, where the specific goal is increasing the resilience of forests at the landscape scale. And we also know that this model can provide a rich array of benefits as described in our research. But forest managers will tell you that there's no single blueprint for implementing this model on the ground and that forest managers need to adapt this model to their own site characteristics and to their own set of management objectives and priorities. Several of the benefits described in our report extend well beyond the headwater region. I mentioned that reducing smoke impacts would benefit communities uh, adjacent to the headwater region in places like the Central Valley and in Eastern California and Western Nevada, to name a few. Sequestering carbon benefits California and society at large by reducing greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to global climate change. And protecting water quality and enhancing water supply could benefit downstream urban and agricultural users of water and hydropower in addition to downstream aquatic ecosystems that depend on cold water flows, as well as visitors to the region that enjoy the, the water-based uh, amenities. What this finding suggests is that there may be broader bases of support for some efforts that generate benefits outside of the headwater region. And so I mentioned um, the uh, California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection's Forest Health Grant Program and the use of state cap and trade funds for forest health projects. I also mentioned water suppliers becoming increasingly engaged in proactive forest management in the upper watersheds. We think that, that there are likely more linkages and opportunities um, for mobilizing the resources of beneficiaries within and outside of the headwater region. However, uncertainties remain about the location, magnitude, and duration of some of these benefits. So I mentioned in terms of increasing water supply that the research is building every year, but it's not quite at the point where uh, the benefits can be reliably predicted at, at very large spatial scales or across longer time frames. Also in terms of um, predicting carbon storage in, in the far future, um, this is a challenging analytical task uh, due to the myriad of factors that go into um, uh, pr predicting these particular outcomes. So research that continues to fill these knowledge gaps will not, only, um, will not only bring more clarity around the value of these benefits to society, but also um, allow us to be more precise with identifying beneficiaries. The set of beneficiaries described in our research represent a broad array of geographies and a diverse mix of of, ob of objectives and resources and positions of the influence. And so the roles that these beneficiaries can play in improving forest health are similarly diverse. Beneficiaries can advocate for expanded forest health efforts. 
They can organize groups of stakeholders around forest health issues and projects. They can provide funding or fill other resource gaps for forest management efforts that benefit themselves and others. And they can develop policies that facilitate larger and more effective forest management efforts. In sum, healthy headwater forests build regional and statewide resilience. Forest management is the vehicle for making forests more resilient to current and future stressors from wildfire, drought, and pests. Improving forest health generates a broad array of, of benefits that accrue to the region and the rest of the state in terms of avoiding future costs, maintaining important functions that society relies on, and even enhancing some of those functions as well. None of the contributors to, the, to this research think that connecting benefits to beneficiaries in any meaningful way is going to be an easy thing to do. Um, far from it. Uh, institutions are, are uh, averse uh, to change. Uh, people are naturally averse to paying for things that they haven't paid for before. But what this report really set out to do was to make it easier to identify those beneficiaries that will or at least should be part of the policy and finance and governance solutions to bringing these forests back to health. So there's a lot more work to be done, but we think that this is a good and necessary first step. And with that, I'll say thank you for your time and attention. And I'll remind you that uh, we're still taking questions um, from the audience at the following email address, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And at this point, I'll turn it over to um, co-author Van Butzik, who is an assistant cooperative extension specialist at UC Berkeley. So please take it away, Van. Hello, it's great to be here today and uh, nice to talk to the 500 people online, which is really impressive. Henry, thanks for your work. The co host start my video. Thanks for your work, Henry, and thanks for your presentation. That was excellent. Um, we're now gonna move on to a really exciting panel today. We have three exceptional panelists. They have a broad range of experience in, in forest management from conducting cutting edge uh, research at University of California, Berkeley to uh, managing huge tracts of, of forest land and also looking at the benefits and connections between forest and water. Um, so we have three panelists today. Those panelists are Angie Avery, She's the executive officer of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. And under Angie's leadership, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy has engaged in large scale management of uh, forest, uh, large cooperative agreements, working with lots of groups of people to manage really large areas. Um, our second panelist is Carmen Tubasing, who is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, I learned today that Carmen is almost no longer a PhD student. She's one signature away. And it turns out that signature is needed from our own co-author, Scott Stevens. So Scott, if you're watching this, uh, come out and sign the form and give Carmen her union card so we can put her to work solving all of our problems in the, the headwater forest. Thanks, man. And finally, finally, we have uh, Willie Whittlesley, who is our uh, general manager of the Yuba Water Agency. And the Yuba Water Agency is well known for their creative work in connecting forest and uh, water issues uh, in the headwaters. And so thank you all three for joining us today. The way we're gonna work the panel today is we are going to have about a half hour of questions where I'll, I'll ask the questions and then we're gonna have 10 minutes of, of Q&A at the end where, where I'll be receiving questions from the audience and Henry has already sort of documented uh, how we're gonna do that. So Carmen, we're gonna start with you. Uh, you're a researcher here at Berkeley and, and your time here, you've been studying disturbance in forests. So wildfires, droughts, pests. And over the last 10 years, uh, California has experienced these disturbances at, at huge scale, scales we, we typically haven't seen, even, if, even in disturbance prone forests like we see in California. So what has your research and science in general, what does it tell us about managing these large disturbance prone landscapes? Well, it tells us that there are opportunities for win-win scenarios where a forest treatment designed to reduce fire risk will likely also have other benefits for carbon storage, um, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, water output, 
et cetera. Um, and we know that forest treatments are beneficial, but it's impossible to implement them on every inch of forest in California. But fortunately, research has shown that even treating a fraction of a landscape can have landscape-wide benefits to that forest in terms of the forest's resilience. So for example, I worked on a project <clears throat> looking at a forest treatment network where only 18% of the landscape was treated with prescribed fire and thinning, um, and, and an actual wildfire came through and burned that landscape, and it experienced less than half of the severe wildfire compared to an untreated landscape. Um, and research has shown that you can achieve those types of landscape-wide benefits by strategically placing the treatments in areas where fire behavior modeling and research has shown that the treatments will help slow down a wildfire. And you can also target the treatments in places that are at the highest risk of a wildfire. So in the project I worked on, um, one of the reasons why it was so effective was that the treatments occurred in the place that would have burned most severely. Um, so that's a really promising finding in terms of implementing treatments, knowing that if we really plan ahead and rely on the best available science, we can achieve um, much larger scale benefits than we might have thought. Thanks. That's a great question to bring us to you, Angie. Um, when we're talking about large scale, uh, your organization works at a very large scale, um, <laughs> pretty much the whole headwater forest. And so, you know, what are you guys doing? What, what, are, how do you address these health, these forest health issues at the scale that you're responsible for? You're right. It's a it's a big region. 25 million acres is a lot of space um, to be thinking about. But um, I think there's a, a variety of roles that we as a state conservancy play uh, in trying to improve forest health. And they range from being a funder. Um, you know, we've we've invested over $121 million over the 13 years that we've been doing grants um, in state and federal funding across the landscape, with a big portion of that being focused on um, forest health. Um, and we think about capacity and we're trying to find ways to build organizational capacity and support collaboratives. But one of the benefits I think of being a small uh, nimble state conservancy with regional expertise and um, a lot of deep and meaningful local relationships means that we can be a little bold and um, probably more innovative than some of the larger state agencies. And I think that you can see evidence of this in the primary initiative that we're working under right now, which is the Watershed Improvement Program. Um, that program was pulled together in 2015 in response to some of the large damaging wildfires that we were seeing like the Rim Fire uh, and the King Fire and it's intended to be a holistic uh, landscape scale restoration program. Um, but Henry mentioned the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative project and I, I think that's a, another example of how a conservancy in, you know, in partnership with others working in the industry can really start to be creative and um, uh, and innovative in how we're thinking about forest health across the landscape. So um, there's a couple of, there's a variety of game changing projects that I think are happening across the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. And I'm glad that Willie is here because he's gonna be able to talk specifically about some of the ways that um, water agencies are, are partnering on, on large landscape scale uh, forest management efforts. But um, in addition to pulling together those collaboratives and sort of going beyond just collaboratives to a regional approach in landscape management. There's a, a scientific process that's coming out of the TCSI, which I think is particularly interesting and has some possible real value if it can be applied in a meaningful way and in a flexible way to meet the needs of, of geographies across the region. And that's the um, what we're referring to as the roadmap to resilience. Uh, it's got a handful of elements to it that I think make it a little bit different, starting with um, defining resilience across the landscape, uh, the Sierra Nevada landscape, um, and really moving towards towards um, a set of resilience values that combine the social and the ecological, right? Um, so, and it sets goals for us as we think about how to move across the landscape. 
Um, once we have did that, we started what we call it, what I refer to as a deep dive resource assessment. And this is a situation where, to Carmen's point about planning ahead and really relying on science, this is where we're trying to do that on the ground, um, using best available science to describe current resource conditions on that landscape um, and compared to desired conditions as, as informed by the eight uh, resilience values that I mentioned before. Um, and then going from there to creating a blueprint for action that is targeted towards resilience um, across this, this particular landscape. Um, from there, we hope to be able to tell the story of success uh, and progress towards achieving those goals on a resilience dashboard. Um, and also to sort of use the results that are coming out of these processes to inform um, placement of uh, wood supply, I mean, wood product um, infrastructure so that we can actually deal in a meaningful way uh, with the with the wood that needs to come out of forest to make them resilient. So when I think about sort of a role that we play and sort of how we're trying to do this in a large scale, I look at this effort, the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative effort, the TCSI, and I think, you know, the, the ability to be nimble, the ability to partner in a meaningful way, and the ability to think strategically and then try and find ways to elevate that creative thinking and apply it more broadly across the landscape um, is something that, that we as a conservancy, a state conservancy can do. And, um, and I think that it will have, I'm hoping that it will have positive impacts uh, and drive us in that resilient direction. Thank you. So Willie, um, you know, this is a forest management talk to some degree and, and you're from a water agency. So, you know, why didn't we bring you here? What is the Yuba Water Agency doing uh, for forest health and, and, and how did your agency get, get going in this? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, why is a water agency here talking about forest management? You know, we have hydroelectric generators and we deliver water to irrigators who irrigate rice fields and, and orchards. So what am I doing here talking with you? Well, the reality is, is our water comes from the Sierra Nevadas and um, we wanna make sure that we deliver um, quality water and we're concerned about quantity of water, of course. Quantity of water, it benefits all of us. It benefits us up in the foothills and the, the high Sierras. We can generate electricity with it. And I mentioned our irrigators can, can use it to irrigate their rice fields and orchards. Um, but the reality is, is the quantity of water in California is, benefits all of us in California. Water that, that lands in, uh, on the crest of the Sierra in our Yuba watershed it can make its way all the way down through the Yuba, into the Feather, into the Sacramento, and into the Delta, and it can go out into the ocean, or it, or it might be um, delivered to Southern California and consumed by users in, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley or um, users in Los Angeles, for example. So we consider ourselves stewards of the lands, and um, we manage groundwater, we manage, um, like I said, our agricultural deliveries, but we also want to work with others and collaborate um, to restore the forest to a resilient condition. And a couple years ago, uh, guys from the Blue Forest Conservation came to us with a creative idea to um, collaborate with the Tahoe National Forest and beneficiaries of the water that comes from the Tahoe National Forest, including Yuba Water Agency, and see if we can collaborate on a, a way to increase the pace and scale of forest restoration in our watershed. And we saw that and, and we, we thought, this is exactly the catalyst that's needed to, to move forest management forward. We have this group that's just coming to us proactively, wanting to come, come up with a solution. And, and we didn't know what the direct benefits were going to be, but we knew that we wanted to prevent our watershed from undergoing a catastrophic wildfire. So any amount of effort to, to move in that direction, we wanted to participate in. And that's how we got involved primarily. And if I can just follow up, I mean, I, I know it's it's pretty early in the project, but but how's it going? How's well, the project it, on, honestly, it's it's going really well. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about that project, and I'll talk about what it's um, it's turned into. Um, the original proof of concept project, the Yuba project, is high up in the Yuba watershed near the summit and the crest of the Sierras, and it's 15,000 acres. And it's you know, Henry basically talked about forest restoration and what those treatments are. It's it's mechanical thinning, it's hand thinning, it's pile burning and it's broadcast burning and also includes meadow restoration. Um, part of that program, we're going to measure the results of the water yield. So we'll see, you know, we all think that if we remove vegetation from the forest, it'll get our water yield more, 
to a natural condition where it was, let's say 150 years ago, pre-fire exclusion. But we wanna measure that and not because we wanna charge anyone for it, but because we wanna know, are, are we truly getting, or what is the, the natural um, annual runoff? Um, and so, so what that project's turned into, and we've, been, we've had two field seasons on that project and we'll probably take fee, three or four to, to, to finish it. Um, but that has led us to a larger project. We're calling it the North Yuba project where we got together with additional agencies and NGOs and, and we dreamt big and we really wanted to treat um, as much of the watershed that, that flows in, into our reservoir as possible. And so, you know, we tossed out the idea, well, what if we, what if we treat the entire North Yuba watershed, something like 275,000 acres? And I thought to myself, are we really talking this scale? Are we really going there? And as a matter of fact, we are. And you saw a picture of, um, uh, during Henry's presentation of a, a handful of us sitting by our reservoir signing a, an MOU um, to where nine entities are going to collaborate on implementing a 275,000 acre forest restoration project, our North Yuba Forest Project. So I couldn't have dreamt a few years ago when the Blue Forest guys showed up in my office and, and came up with this idea that just a few years later, we would be talking about uh, restoration at, at that scale. But that's where we're at right now. It's going to take some time to implement that, obviously. Um, but we're starting to talk like that. We're starting to take action on large scale um, projects. That's wonderful. Thanks for thanks for the update. So Carmen, we we sort of in, in this report we talked about the benefits of of sort of forest management and the benefits of healthy forest. Um, academics sometimes like to call benefits ecosystem services. Uh, can you connect the dots for us? You know what what is a benefit and what's an ecosystem services? An ecosystem service and how do they relate to uh, to forest management? Well, an ecosystem service is anything that an ecosystem provides um, for society or even um, nearby ecosystems or, or biodiversity is considered an ecosystem service. Um, and it can be the case in some ecosystems that um, there are trade-offs between ecosystem services where if you increase one, you might decrease another. If you, you know, take out more you know, during a harvest, then that might decrease biodiversity. The case in um, the Sierra Nevada is really that there are synergies between many ecosystem services at once, um, where science has shown that forest treatments can promote several ecosystem services simultaneously. Um, and I think one thing that's important to think about with ecosystem services is that it can be a valuable way to put a number on um, a benefit. So you could quantify how much water does this ecosystem produce or how much carbon does this ecosystem sequester and that can provide more of a, a framework for incentivizing conservation um, or in this case forest treatments. But it's really difficult to quantify all of the services that an ecosystem can provide simultaneously and if we have good numbers on one ecosystem service, but not great numbers on the rest, it can produce kind of a confusing situation. So like, for example, let's say you know exactly how much carbon a forest stores and you have a pretty good estimate of how much carbon that forest would store if a wildfire came through. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell you about the other ecosystem services that would be promoted by treating the forest to prevent that fire. Because there's no guarantee that if you treat an area, a wildfire actually would come through in the lifespan of that treatment. But the treatment might also help with water output and habitat for certain wildlife species um, and definitely improve the resilience of the forest to things like drought and pest outbreak that's a really important one, increasingly in the Sierra Nevada. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a really tough question. And this was a question. This is a question we honestly only partially answered in the report. And and so I I agree with you. We have a lot of these nice win wins in forest management in the Sierra Nevada, and then we have a few really tricky endangered species. Mm -hmm. And and so how do we deal with this? How, how do we think about these endangered species uh, within this big suite of ecosystem services and benefits? And especially since they seem to play this tricky role of, of being maybe the one area where it's not a win-win. Good, very good question. <laughs> so, 
Are you possibly talking about owls? <laughs> yeah, owls. Owls would be sort of the prime, the prime example, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's important to think about the long term when thinking about that kind of an issue. So the, the issue that Van is alluding to is the fact that owls like dense forests with large trees. Um, and they really like that high canopy cover that's produced by a dense forest. Um, and so there are some people who say, well, if you thin the forest, you're reducing the habitat for owls. And so that's not a win-win. But if you think about it down the line, it's kind of similar to the carbon sequestration issue where you're taking out a little bit of carbon or you're taking out a little bit of owl habitat in the short term, but in the long term, you're increasing the resilience um, or you're increasing the stability of that carbon. Or in the, owl, in the case of the owls, um, owls don't really like an open forest, but they really don't like a forest that's completely burned down. So <laughs> you are actually doing good in the long term. And research, some research has shown that though owls do prefer dense canopy, what they really like is patchiness. So it gets back to this idea of a, a mosaic. So they, they like having areas of dense canopy that are close to their nest. And we have something called packs in the Sierra Nevada, which are you know the area right around an owl nest. You, you can't touch. You can't do a forest treatment in that area. Um, but then if you do treat areas a little bit around that, it provides them hunting ground so that they can briefly go into an open area and hunt. And I'm not a wildlife biologist. So you know, <laughs> if yeah. anyone wants to correct me in the question email, feel free. Um, but I do think that even issues that seem to be, you know, real trade-offs at first glance mm -hmm. might actually have more of a win-win if you zoom out. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for that very thoughtful answer. So, Angie, you you talked a lot, or we talked a lot about about um, identifying benef beneficiaries in this report, and we we sort of go on to say, okay, the next step is really figuring out how to, how to connect these beneficiaries to, uh, to paying for or contributing in some way to, to forest management. Uh, your group works with a lot of different agencies, a lot of different groups. How, how are you seeing this? Are you seeing people making this connection between the benefits and, and getting them mobilized to action? Or, or do you see that as an area that, that we need to improve? So it's a really good question, Van. Um, I think the water agencies are a prime example of beneficiaries, especially water agencies like the Yuba Water Agency and others, the Placer County Water Agency and, and others across the Sierra Nevada are examples of folks who saw the changes across the forested landscape and were able to understand in a meaningful way the impacts to their own operations and then sort of change behaviors over time to embrace um, a new way of thinking that maybe was different from something they 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 thought or ways they thought in the past. Um, I think there are opportunities for a variety of other beneficiaries to engage in more meaningful ways. Um, it is going to be, I think, a challenging um, situation. Um, but I, I loved the the report that you guys um, wrote. The really identified, I think, some critical steps and, and roles that beneficiaries can play. I think there's some. Um, additional opportunities some you know you know if, if if beneficiaries are doing you know embracing advocacy or funding or policy development or organizing to address some of these forest and watershed issues um, I think we need to have them thinking about economic systems so for example um, we really need additional wood processing infrastructure across the Sierra Nevada if we're truly going to manage our forests to resilience um, so roles that beneficiaries can play um, if you're thinking sort of holistically across the state of California, research and development, how do we promote innovation and embrace um, and create new markets for new technologies like mass timber? Um, you know, if we're really going to move our forest to a state of resilience, how do we actually build up the workforce that's necessary? And so can we engage uh, community colleges or, or others um, to invest in workforce training or small business development um, uh, folks to, to help us think about how to actually um, really build up those businesses or provide new business funding. Um, so we're seeing it in certain places, I think where there are direct impacts. Um, and I think that uh, 
uh, it, it, there are a variety of additional opportunities, uh, public private partnerships, um, urban rural partnerships, workforce development partnerships, things like that. Um, I think it's going to take some outreach, uh, some data and some information to really make those connections. Mm -hmm. And it's something we've thought about for uh, a, a while. Um, but there are lots of opportunities, especially if you start to think about some of the costs that are coming from unhealthy forests and really trying to think about how you maybe get people from reactive mode, sort of disaster reaction to proactive. And we're starting to see that with state funding, but I think there are a whole lot more opportunities for us to go even farther, but it'll be interesting. Uh, and it's definitely a challenge. And Willie, I guess I'd ask you the same question a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, within your agency, um, have you been able to, to find beneficiaries who are excited to, to join up? Um, are your, your farmers and irrigators downstream uh, looking at, looking at the, the innovative work you guys are doing and cheering you on, or are they sort of, you know, squinting and, and wondering what's happening? Uh, well, you, you always have your skeptics, but I think, you know, our... Um, the farmers in, in Yuba County, they support this. They support things that the agency does to protect the water supply. Um, where I see um, you know, proof of the benefit to the Yuba Water Agency is, is the direct um, cost avoidance of, you know, we looked at what happened to Placer County Water Agency as a result of the King Fire, and we saw all the sediment and debris that was input into their reservoirs and the millions of dollars it took them to, to you know, remove that material and, and get their facilities back up and running. And, and we haven't experienced even, you know, a small significant wildfire in the North Yuba. And, you know, in my mind, other than it being, um, you know, overstocked with trees, it's in great condition and we want to prevent that same impact. And so what we want to do is avoid the cost of that. So, so those are the direct, um, you know, benefits to the water agency. But, you know, expanding beyond that, we've been able to, to take an advantage of the shift in society or the shift in culture where, you know, maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago or even 10 years ago, you know, removing trees from the forest wasn't popular and Carmen touched on this, but the reality is, is we have to look long term and we have to look watershed wide and our forests aren't sustainable in the condition that they're in right now and we need to get them in a sustainable, resilient condition. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, that means treating the forest in a way that we haven't treated them before. We've loved our forests to death. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I love going to the Sierras and go camping and, and enjoying our forests, but I don't want to see the catastrophic wildfire like, like Henry showed a slide of where every single tree is burned, you know, but what I could live with is I could live with patchy fires that burn, you know, less than a few thousand acres and burn through our forest and our forests are resilient. What does resilience mean to me? It means that the forest can survive a wildfire. So the, the wildfire is not catastrophic and, and they can, um, return to some function, right? And, and restore themselves naturally. And that's really what we're driving towards is, is that type of condition in our Sierra forests. Excellent. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask one COVID question just because it's sort of interesting right now. Very briefly, we just have two minutes before we go on to the Q&A with the, with the audience, but um, are any of your, your projects, and this is, this is open to all three of you, maybe we'll start with Carmen and the, the field research side and then move to, to Angie and then to Willie, but um, are any of your, your projects being impacted at all or your field research being impacted at all by, by COVID? Not my personal field research, but there are a lot of important field campaigns going on in my labs that are delayed or up in the air. Um, maybe they might resume later in the summer it's, it's really too bad because there's so much exciting research going on. Um, but I think the projects that will be prioritized are the ones that are long-term monitoring efforts. Because when you study forests, it's, impar it's important to capture processes that happen slowly over decades. These are long-lived trees. Um, and so hopefully we can squeeze in a little bit of continuation of that monitoring to not have a break in the data. Um, and otherwise, I think people will be, you know, using the other tools at our disposal, things like remote sensing, LIDAR, like existing large data sets. There's plenty of work for us to do, uh, even if the field season is a little cut short. Unfortunately, in the Sierra Nevada, our field season is just the summer. So once the snow starts, we can't really do the kind of research we were thinking we'd do. Right. But you, Angie? 
Um, you know, I think building on what Carmen was saying about the field season, um, many of the projects that we funded are at higher elevations, and so lots of them are still under snow. So I don't think we're seeing any major roadblocks at this time, um, but it's still early. Um, Carmen also alluded to um, sort of the the limitations or sort of the ban on prescribed fire that are that are, that's in place right now, and um, we're hoping that that will change over time and in time for us to maybe embrace that because I think prescribed fire is an important tool for managing the landscape. Um, so right now that is banned by the US Forest Service. So that is one thing that we're tracking and watching closely. Um, but right now, I think it's still too early for us to answer the question in a meaningful way. How about you, Willie? Yeah, uh, as far as the impacts from COVID, um, the water agency is still functioning as normal. We definitely um, have implemented mitigation measures, uh, social distancing. Um, for example, um, we have a crew of, of about 40 folks that work on all of our facilities, our various powerhouses and, and dams. And instead of reporting to one central office building now, we're reporting remotely to different facilities and we're keeping our teams um, reporting in small groups of three to four so they're not um, working amongst each other as often. Um, the folks that can work from home are working from home. Uh, we do have a very limited office staff that still comes into the office. I've been coming to the office every day, but my door's shut and I'm, I'm social distancing. Um, but as far as our function, we're still um, managing the watershed um, as planned and we we're still moving projects forward, construction projects in the field. We're, we're just implementing those with our social distancing um, efforts. As far as our, our, our watershed health programs or our forest restoration programs, you know, we're still meeting with our collaborators um, on Zoom, just like we're doing here today. And we're still driving projects forward. We're still planning on, um, you know, our projects, uh, hitting our project milestones, like, you know, environmental permitting and um, in-field surveys. And we're still planning on implementing it. In my mind, it's not going to slow us down. Now, we'll see how long this lasts. And, and like Angela uh, mentioned, a lot of our projects are at high elevation. They're still under snow now. And we don't know, you know, where we're going to be in a couple months once the snow melts. But I'm hoping that we get as much done as we had planned this year. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all for the update. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to some uh, Q&A from the audience. And um, I just wanna say we've received a huge amount of questions. So uh, if we don't get to your question, I apologize. And you know, let's try to keep these answers short and we'll try to just run through these as, as quick as we can. And so the first question is from David Zielinski and he's interested, uh, Angie, this might, might be coming to you. If you could please speak to the economic feasibility and environmental impact of biomass plants after forest die-off events, including co-location of energy generation, full planting mills, sawmills, and soil amendment. So the economic feasibility of biomass uh, How about that? facilities. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's a really good question and something that um, with the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative project that I that I talked about that we're actually exploring in some of the later phases of the work. Um, I don't think that uh, biomass facilities as they're currently operating are truly penciling out as well as we would hope they would. They would. Um, we've seen uh, a variety of obstacles in terms of getting them up and running. But on the TCSI, we are testing this concept of, of doing a really detailed uh, wood analysis, wood supply analysis, and taking that information, coupling it with some economic analyses that are actually happening, um, and trying to turn that into, um, based on the wood supply and sort of the location of it, recommendations for wood processing facilities um, that, uh, that that maybe uh, are, are strategically located to m minimize the amount of uh, transportation it takes to get there. And I think I'm just barely touching on the depth of that question there, yeah. but um, <laughs> it, it's that's one we could spend the next four hours talking about. So Agreed. Agreed. it's a real concern and it's definitely something we're thinking about. And again, trying to test game changing ideas uh, as it relates to this one particular landscape that we're working on. Perfect. So this next question, uh, how about we'll go Carmen, you can answer it first, and then we'll, we'll go with Willie after that. Um, and so this is a question from Susan Longville, and it is, where can wholesale agencies like San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water, where I serve as director, find the methods for estimating increased average annual stream flow from forest thinning? So is there any good resources, uh, maybe in the scientific literature or in the more applied literature to, to try to figure this out, to try to figure out how thinning impacts stream flow? I would definitely look to some research that's happened um, in the Scott Stevens lab um, 
I I can't name particular uh, like individual sources or papers right now, but there definitely is um, science out there on how to quantify that. Billy, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I would go directly to Dr. Roger Bales at UC Merced. If he's not working on it, he knows who is. Perfect. Uh, so next question. Um, I'll open this one up to whoever wants to take it. Um, a lot of forest where these benefits come from are federally owned. What kind of challenges does this pose? Um, do you think that the pandemic, uh, we'll skip that part. So what kind of challenges are posed by the fact that a lot of the forests that we want managed are, are owned by the feds? Anybody wanna jump in on that, Willie? All right. Yeah, I'll take it. So, I mean, the federal forests are our forests, right? I mean, they're, they're federal government forests, they're owned by us. So the reality is, is we need to keep the owners happy and, and that's keeping <laughs> the public happy. And that's a struggle, right? And that's, that's where we've come a long way recently with, with kind of the culture shift and people realizing that, you know, these catastrophic wildfires that are impacting us and displacing people from their homes and causing, you know, pollution in the runoff and, you know, all the smoke impacts. I mean, you, we saw the picture of Clovis, California and, and smoke in the valley. Um, we're having this culture shift where people are realizing now that we do need to remove trees from our forests. So I think that shift has taken place. But now the question is, is how do we actually do it? We have thousands and thousands of acres that need to, to undergo restoration, or, or as Carmen said, at least a, a portion of them need to undergo restoration. And how do we pay for it? And how do we actually do it? Angie's mentioning, you know, forest product, product infrastructure. Do we do we have the forest product in, infrastructure in the state to do this at the scale we need to do it? Those are the challenges. But I, I want to impress on everyone that I think the culture is shifting and people are realizing that this work needs to be done. And if you read your, your guys' report, Henry and your report, that's a great summary of what really needs to be done. And now the question is, how do we do it? Yep, go for it, Angie. Um, I, would, I would just add on to what Willie was saying that the culture of the Forest Service is shifting. I think that, you know, when we founded the Watershed Improvement Program, um, the Forest Service was partners uh, with us as well as the Tahoe Conservancy. Um, and I, we're looking at them as we think about, um, you know, they're active partners on the Tahoe Central Sierra landscape. They are active partners with us. Um, you know, across our region. Um, and so I, I try and think about it as, you know, what are the opportunities and how do we sort of inform what they're doing? And, and this is where my sort of belief in the, the process that I described earlier, that's resilience based. Um, how do we work with them to sort of identify those resilience goals and then partner with them to get them done? And, and so I think there's, there are opportunities to work with them in different ways. And, and, and just want to uh, second, again, uh, Willie's point that yeah. I think that the culture there is shifting. They, they have capacity issues and they have limitations on that front, but uh, they're willing partners and they're actively engaged at the state at the state level with Cal Fire and California Natural Resources Agency in what they're calling shared stewardship. So um, I think they're trying to be good partners, and I think that's uh, a really valuable opportunity that we should be embracing. So we have two minutes left. And I'm going to ask a final question. And so uh, I want 30, 30 second responses to this big question. Okay, you can change one thing, policy wise, funding wise, culture wise to improve the forest of California. Uh, Carmen, we'll start with you. <laughs> but what would, what would your one thing be? Oh man. Um... I guess I'll channel Scott Stevens and say, I think better investment in community outreach and um, putting more people with scientific backgrounds into the communities influenced by these decisions. Um, the, you know, so many of the beneficiaries are rural communities that um, we do a lot of good research over near the coasts and I think they could benefit some, from some of that and having more um, people hired as liaisons would be really helpful. Excellent, uh, Angie? Long-term sustainable funding that helps to create meaningful jobs in the forest sectors. Uh, I mean, long-term permanent jobs. So not just going into the forest the first time, but managing them for the, all of the benefits that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many, so many upsides to making sure that our, our rural communities can sort of re-embrace the sort of the, the forest sector work that we know needs to happen. Yeah. All right, Willie, the last word is yours. All right, so what makes me crazy about 
um, some of our forest management practices, even the good ones that I'm involved in today is that we, we pile material and we burn it. If we could find ways to use that material, and we had a question on biomass energy, and I think that's part of the solution, but if we could find ways to use the, the lower quality material, uh, whether it's new technologies or new products, what makes me crazy is just watching us, you know, put all that smoke up into the air after we spent all the money and time and effort to put it in a pile, then we just, then we just burn it. If we could do something with that material, it'd be wonderful. Excellent. Well, Angie, Carmen, and Willie, thank you so much for your time. That was a, a very enjoyable and informative panel. Uh, Henry, thank you for your work on the, the paper and your wonderful presentation and all the PPIC staff for putting together this uh, wonderful, wonderful afternoon.